Praise the Lord. Good morning. This is Bishop Joseph Castillo here, and we're glad to be with you here earlier this Monday morning. Apostle Paul Sheridan will be with us here in a moment, and we're just glad to be here. I see Sister Erica is on this morning with us. God bless you. Good to see you, Sister Erica. Amen. Erica Tolbert in in, in Livonia area there, Michigan, Detroit. God bless the rest from, from the River Saints of Livonia. Amen. I hope everyone had a beautiful uh, weekend here. We are cooling off in Houston. And yesterday, we uh, our church had a new uh, location that we christened, and, and that was a beautiful service. Uh, unfortunately, we did lose the audio on it. Uh, I wanted to podcast the message from yesterday, but... We lost the audio in the sound booth, so unfortunately, I might just have to go on and preach it again on a live stream or something and capture that audio so we could podcast it out because it was a very good message. We're teaching uh, on a series called Church Incorporated, uh, Church Incorporated, and we're dealing with the spiritual church. You know, and how the spiritual church must be addressed and taught and trained and raised up versus the church incorporated, the marketing beast that the church has become in the West. So we're talking about that. Uh, Brother Yancey, God bless you. Good to see you this morning. And uh, let's just run you guys a a little clip of the church here and kind of see what we're doing here in Houston. I want to show the love and power to show His mercy and grace. Amen. So there's a little, little, some clips from our church there. And uh, that beautiful uh, song I wrote that, the lyrics uh, uh, of that song, I, I, I could say co wrote it with um, Pastor Brile. So we're, we're glad to be here this morning. And um, there's a couple of things that I wanted to share from the Word of God today. And in based upon where what we are into at Church Incorporated. What I was saying at Church Incorporated is how in the charismatic Pentecostal uh, service, they have taken the, the the teaching of the seed that we have in in, in Corinthians, Second Corinthians, that says, A him that sows sparingly should be sparingly, and those who sow um, uh, bountifully should be bountifully. And we took in that truth, and we we built out a a lot more teaching around that for the sake of fundraising. And um, as while it's been effective in raising funds, uh, you know the Baptists also uh, have been very effective raising funds. So have the Catholics. So you know, uh, maybe not to the same tune in in, in short time impact that Pentecostals have been. Uh, because they don't have this teaching on seed faith. But when we really look at what seed is, the central message of seed in Scripture is that seed is God's Word. That's the central message of what seed is. Now, you can apply the the concept of seed to giving. You could uh, apply the concept of seed to uh, to, 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 to even on the, like I said yesterday, I reverse engineered it. So we looked at Mark chapter four and we looked at how Jesus talked about what the seed really is in, in this, in his parable is the word of God. But I also reverse engineered that. And I talked about seed, uh, in, you know, Jesus said is the word of God. It can bring forth fruit. Well, I talked about it in the opposite also the, uh, the negative seeds you know, demonic seeds, negative seeds also can bear fruit on the negative side. And I talked about how really most people deal with things and and, and live under certain type of ceilings and certain type of guards and certain type of limitations 
based upon seeds that were planted in their life and most times from childhood. And so I, I gave the testimony of one of the elders in our church, Elder Juan, Elder Juan uh, from Juan Lim from Singapore. And he was always told growing up from his dad that he sounded silly when he spoke, that he wasn't clear. He stuttered. He sounded silly. He was not comprehensive. You know, when he spoke, there wasn't comprehension there. And so his dad would always tease him. So as a result, he was technically speaking a mute. Now he could speak. You know, he wasn't a physical mute, but he was just, he would never talk. He was always quiet, never shared his opinion, never made a conversation, couldn't approach anybody, couldn't uh, fu uh, function any job that really had, you know, communication at, at, the, at the core of it. And because of this, seeds that were planted by his father. And so it was actually... He was in a service or a ministry in his church. He became born again, and he was in a, some deliverance uh, a, a time of prayer and deliverance in the church. And through the word of knowledge, one of the pastors had saw his dad speaking this over him. And he said, your mouth has been locked. I'm seeing the lock, and your mouth has been locked. You've been locked into silence. And um, and this actually triggers another thought that I have, too, and I'll share this in a second. He said, your mouth has been locked in the silence. So he goes on, and they begin to pray for him, that his mouth would be unlocked, his mouth would be loosed. And he heard an audible, uh, right there in the prayer meeting, he heard audible uh, unlocking, like like a prison door was shut and ching, and it would lock. He heard an audible unlocking, and his mouth was loosed, and he was delivered from that day forward. And now, he is a trainer, works for Mercedes Benz. He trains all the dealerships uh, on the sales floors in 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 China. So he goes around and he trains all the dealerships there, and the uh, in China, and tells them how to sell, how to set up, and how to do the show floor and all that. And he had a big breakthrough through uh, ministry time, but it was the seeds that were planted by his father that had really, for years, affected him. And in, in a lot of times, teachers plant seeds, uh, uh, you know, authority figures in people's lives plant seeds, and those seeds could spring up. Some 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 people don't affect them that much. Some thirty, some sixty, some a hundredfold, based upon the condition of the heart. You know, so we really you know, have to see the power of those words and those seeds. Amen. I see Pastor, uh, Pastor Paul is entering the studio here. He'll be with us in, in a moment. But uh, I was, was, was with a man of God named Prophet Kevin Leal, Kevin Leal. And we were together and he was ministering to some young girls that had been a hit on or had been um, touched in a in a bad way sexually by ministers. And uh, the minister had told this young lady, she was a pastor's wife, actually. He had told her, don't ever say a word. You know, be silent. Don't tell anybody. The pastor told told the young girl. She was a young girl. And and he looked at her. Nope. She didn't say this to anybody. He got this through the word of knowledge. He looked at her and, she, and he just called out. He said, he told you not to say anything. And she looked at him and he said, he, 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 your mouth has been locked shut. Your, your mouth has been bound because he told you to keep his secret. And she just started crying. And we're all shocked. We're all in the room there. This is a prominent pastor's wife. You know, I don't even know if the pastor knew. You know, and I have it on video. I, I never shared it because to protect her anonymity. And she just starts bawling. And then he starts going off prophesying. He's like, that pastor abused you and told you to keep your secret. And you were just a young girl. And it was just, and she got delivered right there. She was weeping, crying, fell on the floor, like, like collapsed under the, the, the breaking that, and he broke that curse through the word, through the prophetic, through the word of knowledge that had bound this young girl who's in her 30s all the way from her teens. And so that was a seed plan, and that time was by a pastor. 
and that seed had kept her under a heavy yoke for many, many years. So, you know, it, what Christ said in Mark chapter 4 about the, the words being sown and growing up and producing fruit, it works on both ends. You could reverse engineer it and see how that works on both ends, you know. And so what happens when we have had these negative seeds planted, you can begin to uproot those by planting positive seeds, planting positive seeds. And even as a pastor, uh, sometimes instead of uh, calling it like it is, when you have somebody in the church, say somebody comes in the church and they're rebellious or they're, um, they're this or they're that negative thing, instead of saying, oh, such a so-and-so, she's so rebellious, really we should start to speak and plant positive seeds over that person. And, you know, you, you recognize when you say, you know, I rebuke, I, I cast out, rebuke that, you know, that rebellious spirit declares she is meek. I declare she is humble. And so even your conversation over certain members should be planting positive seeds because as a pastor, your role is to steward their growth, their deliverance, their, you know, and a, and a church is a hospital. A church is a place that where people come who are sick that need to be healed and restored. So, uh, oftentimes people get into this thing where they'll they'll point out the problems in the people coming to their church with their with even with their wife in private or with another pastor or whatever. But you have to be careful because there's a certain degree where you should be speaking. There's one thing of diagnosing an issue, but there's another thing of of getting a little into complaining. And then you don't want to get into complaining. You want to get into speaking life, planting positive seeds, even if they don't hear it, because in the spirit realm, they can carry weight and they do carry weight. I, I, I just recently saw a post somebody put. Uh, and it was it wasn't really a Christian thing necessarily. It might have been. But they said uh, they, they said something that was powerful. They said that. Be careful the words that you speak over people, even when they're not around, because uh, words can be prayers or words can be curses. He said that's why they call it spelling. Spelling. How do you spell this? How do you spell that? Spelling, because by speaking things over people, it's casting a spell, or or, or in one aspect we could call because you know in 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 the in the dark side they call it a, casting a spell, and the light we say saying a prayer, releasing a prayer, praying over them. But it, it, it's the same concept, releasing spiritual energy towards somebody through your words prayer or casting a spell so you could be uh, casting a spell cursing somebody by saying negative things over them uh not diagnosing an issue but but speaking negative things over them so uh, the way that you can in your personal life you can uproot those negative seeds planted from you know an authority figure from a father from whatever took place in your life and in my and yesterday i was sharing uh, that the judge, when I was, you know, a teenager, the judge, I was arrested several times. And the judge said, Joey is a menace to society and he needs to be put away on a long term basis to, you know, upstate the Department of Corrections. He's a menace to society. Well, at that time I was. But see, as I got saved shortly after that, I had the root out that mentality. I felt like I was a menace to society. I was a non-productive member of society. And now I am ministering to society. I'm ministering to ambassadors. I'm ministering to uh, global leaders. I'm ministering to prime ministers, ambassadors, uh, you know, in, 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 in the United Nations. And so now somebody who was once a menace is now a blessing, is now refreshing, is now a minister, an aid to society. But those seeds had to be uprooted. And, and really, by the grace of God, I ended up in a great church. I ended up in Pastor Bill Winston's church, Living Word Christian Center. And he gave us 21 scriptures. He gives it to everybody. Uh, when you first come and get water baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost, he gives you 21 scriptures. And, he, and they say, take this home and declare these 21 scriptures over you. Uh, I think they said to do it seven times a day. Now, it might seem a lot to some people, but... Shoot, for me, I needed that, you know, so I just, you know, coming out of prison, getting saved, 
and I'm still having to deal with the temptations for drugs and alcohol and I get, and, and having this mentality that I'm a menace to society, I'm unproductive, I'm no good. But I would take these 21 scriptures and they were a who and what I am in Christ. And I would go over them and, and uh, I would confess these scriptures seven times a day. Oh, it looks like Pastor Paul has started and been going for a, a few minutes, too, on another channel. Not not sure how that happened. Amen. Okay, so he'll be, he'll be with us here shortly. Not sure how that happened. But I would take these scriptures, and I would uh, confess them. They would say, I'm an heir of Christ. I'm a joint heir with 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 Jesus. I'm an heir of God, a joint heir with Christ. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above only not beneath. You know, all these kind of identity scriptures. And I would take those, uh, you know, I'm the lender, not the borrower, you know, so on. And I would take those as they were instructed me to do it, living word. And I would confess them and uh, seven times a day. And what it really began to do is it really began to plant new seeds in my mind, new seeds in my heart, and really begin to to change the way that I thought who uh, who I was and what my trajectory was, my relationship was with society, with people, uh, and so forth. And it really started planting in me because growing up in, in this kind of, you know, environment that I grew up in where, you know, my mother was a single mom, we were on food stamps, we were poor, you know, I never had the Nikes. My mom used to buy bikies from Payless. And, you know, I, I had this mentality that I was less than beneath, you know, a, a menace to society, so on. I don't even remember the uh, times where we were walking on the streets uh, up to no good, drinking beers, walking on the streets, doing drugs, you know, and uh, people, sometimes people in the community would, would drive by and say, you low lives." Get out of the street. Police would come up. Hey, you low lifes, get out of the street. Go home, you know. And and we would say, hey, screw off. But those words stuck in our mind and stuck in our heart. So, you know, I, all that had to really come and get rooted out by taking the word of God, meditating the word of God, declaring the word of God, and begin to create a new image. And as that image begins to spring up, begin to grow up, begins to produce fruit 30, 60, 100 fold, then uh, there is an elevation that began to take place. So let's let's take a look at a few of the comments. Uh, Faith says, good morning. Amen. Good morning. Brother Darren there says, good morning, family. Brother Askew says here, good morning. Blessings to you. Nard Spandok from the Philippines. Long time no see. Good to see you. Thanks for tuning in with us. Amen. Amen. Uh, Sister Ask you is on as well. Praise God. Erica, you were the first one on, right? When I started at 730, you were the first one on. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Good to see you, Sister Erica. Amen. So all of these words are seeds. And, and I wanted to zone in here on a particular verse in Mark chapter 4 that I, a lot of people just kind of throw this verse out when they're studying, reading, or teaching, or preaching Mark chapter 4. And uh, just so you know, if you don't know, Mark 4 is where it says, the sower sows the word, some fell on stony ground, some fell on good ground, some fell on the ground that had not much earth. So this is that particular parable. Now, Jesus says here, Matter of fact, I could put it on the screen for you all. Mark chapter 4, verse 14. Mark 4, 14. Here we go. Okay, let's put this on the screen. There we go. Mark 4:14. 4, Number 1 Jesus says in verse 13 and if you listen to my the podcast from last Sunday um you'll hear this one. He says to them, if you don't know this parable, how would you know all parables? In other words, uh I call this the grandfather parable. This parable really 
breaks down and applies so many things in regards to the operation of the kingdom of God. And so he says, if you don't really grasp this, if you don't really comprehend this, it's going to be difficult for you to understand all other things. And he says specifically here that the seed is the word of God. The sower sows the word. So my question uh, to you as we move into this, looking at the word being sown, because he says these are those which are sown by the wayside. When they when the way hear the word, Satan comes immediately and takes the word that was sown in their hearts. So if the imagery of a seed is the word, then we see Christ here is saying that the imagery of the soil is what? Your heart. Your soil is your heart. You are the soil. And so is it surprising that we are the soil if you are made from soil? We are made from soil. God took from the, from the soil. He took from the dust of the ground. He took from the earth and he formed man. So you are, your, your physical body is made from the soil. So it's not a stretch to understand at all. Matter of fact, there, it's a link here to see that when Jesus is talking about the soil in Mark chapter 4, he's talking about you. Your body, your being is designed just as soil. It is soil to produce and to reproduce the seeds that are sown. Very powerful truth here. And so he goes in, in into this and begins to teach on this. And many of us have heard teachings on this and we've studied this. But then people kind of oftentimes drop out this verse. 2021, we've, we always hear lots of teaching on some 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold. And there's all kinds of even some really weird teachings that are not even make sense biblically. You know, but, you know, people talk about this 100-fold, 30-60-fold, 100-fold, you know. But. Oftentimes people drop out these two verses or they read them and they don't commentate on them uh, because it doesn't seem to fit. The entire chapter, Jesus is talking about seed and soil, the seed of the word of God. The word of God is a seed. You plant it and it'll grow up in spring. You know, so people don't really understand how this fits in. Verse 21 says, and he says unto them, and I didn't get a chance to teach this yesterday for the sake of time. I didn't get a chance to bring this up, but I want to highlight it this morning with everybody. Uh, because, you know, discipleship is really not made in, in service, in church. It's the, really the meetings after the meetings that disciples are made. And that's kind of what the Greater Glory Show is, is doing, is spending time discipling uh, our, our friends here, our family that's watching, our, our faith family. So in verse 21, this often just gets left out or not even commentated on. But he says to them, is a candle to be put under a bushel or under a bed and not to be set on a candlestick? Then he says, for there is nothing hid which shall not be made manifest. Neither was anything kept secret. That it, sh that it should come abroad. If any man have ears, let him hear. And then he says, take heed to what you hear, to what measure you meet, should measure it unto you. you know, and, he, and he goes back talking about casting seed into the ground. The kingdom of God is if man would cast seed into the ground. You sleep right day and night. You know? So typically, what I've seen in, in 22 years is that these scriptures here, 21 and 22, are often, of, often taught as there's nothing hidden that shall not be revealed. Be careful what you do. Uh, it's going to come to lie. God's going to expose you. He's going to expose everything. And we've always heard this taught in, under, that, under that light. And But when we don't ever hear this taught within the light of sowing seeds, so or so with the word. We never see it in the light of the word of God being sown so that it can produce in your life. And the reason why is because people haven't really understood that these verses are not just random words that Christ spoke like he threw a wrench into the engine. These two verses are not a wrench in the engine. It's the exact same topic. And what he's saying is that you cannot sow the word 
and it not produce in your life. You cannot sow the word and it not manifest in your life. So that's what he's saying here in verse 21. He said unto them, is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed? No. Shouldn't it be on a candlestick? In other words, if you're sowing the word, it's what what you sow into your life in private that it's not it's not just so you can uh, have your devotion time. It's not just so you can, you know, it reminds me of Dr. Lesher Summerall, my spiritual grandfather. You know, uh, he would go to Smith Wigglesworth's house. You know, one, one day he was preaching in England. Smith was standing on the platform and he was out there ministering. And Smith, you know, came up to him after the service and said, hey, that was a great message you gave. But that last, you know, that last five minutes, I forgot the exact amount of time he said, but that last five minutes was not from God at all. That was the flesh. And so Lester Summerall was was just kind of shocked and he was shook to be on the platform with this veteran, you know. And Smith says, I want you to come to my house tomorrow at, at such and such time. Uh, the, the exact details Frank told me, but I just kind of forgot some of the small details that what time it was, whatever. But he said, come to my house tomorrow morning. So he thought he was about to really get reamed out by, by Brother Wigglesworth. So he goes there, and he, he ends up going to his house. Long story short, I'm going to cut out some of the details. But he goes to his house, and they sit there, and they read the scriptures for five minutes, and then they pray for five minutes. Then they read the scriptures for five minutes, and then they pray for five minutes. Smith didn't tell Let's just summarize what they were doing. He just said, come sit with me and join me in, in my devotion time. And so they, they went on like this for hours, five minutes prayer, five minutes reading, five minutes prayer, five minutes reading. And he's just going along doing this with Smith. And then at a certain juncture, he calls in his wife, brings some tea and biscuits and it's time for tea. So they have tea. And then after tea, they go back into it. Five minutes praying, five minutes, you know. And so they did this. And this went on day after day after day. He would come and they would meet and they would do this day after day. And he felt like, hey, you know, I'm out here on the mission field. I'm out here in England, you know, this and that. And, um, uh, you know, what are we doing? We're just, we're just, we, we're not even really talking. He's not mentoring me. He's not telling me anything. He's not teaching me anything. He's just, you know, making me sit down and read five minutes and pray five minutes, read five minutes, pray five minutes. And he was really kind of confused about what, what is all this about, but he, he don't want to say anything. But after a, a certain time, a week or so of doing this, when he was walking back home from Smith's house, in his belly, he felt this surge of power. He felt this, 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 this ball of energy, this strength surging and pulsing in his inner man, in his spirit man. And the Holy Ghost told him, this is what Smith has been giving you. Can, is a candlestick made to be put under a bed or a bushel? In other words, what you, what the, the investment in the word that you're sowing privately is meant for public demonstration. When Smith, when Lester Summerall left England, he went to the Manila, Philippines, and within a, a short period of time, over 100,000 souls got saved in a massive revival, historic revival, that Lester Summerall had in the Philippines. A woman in Billy Bid Prison that had the principality, Lester tells us, uh, the principality of age of, of the Philippines was in this demonized woman in Billy Bid prison. He went in there, had a powerful deliverance that was all over the newspapers, international news. Uh, then they, the, the mayor of the city gave him the sunken gardens to have an outdoor crusade for 30 days where he brought in Morris Rillo. He brought in, uh, uh, or Roberts, he brought in Rex Humbard, and for 30 days they had a, a massive crusade there, and over 100,000 souls got saved in 30 days. And I went to the Sunken Gardens, I interviewed people who were in that revival, I took Papa Frank Summerall, one of my one of my mentors, I took him there, and we actually went into the Billy Bid prison and told the story in the prison cell and filmed it, and it's on my channel, 
If you go to my YouTube channel, it's on my channel where we're in the prison, we're preaching in the prison, we tell the story in the prison. There was they said that there was every night a uh, six monster dump trucks would come to the sunken gardens and they would have to fill up those dump trucks with crutches and wheelchairs and, and all of these things. And they'd have to load them in there. And because so many people were getting healed and so many miracles were happening and the mayor gave Lester Summerall the first license for a Protestant church in the Catholic Philippines. That's what happened from taking that candlestick from taking that time, investing that word of God in his heart. And so this is what it's saying in verse 22. It's not speaking in the negative. There's nothing hid which shall not be manifested. He's talking about, what's, what's he talking about being hid? He's not talking about his sin being hid. He's talking about thy word have I hid in my heart that I should not sit against you. Nothing hid. If you hide that word in your heart, there's nothing hid that shall not be manifested. There's nothing you do in your secret time, in your prayer closet, that shall not come abroad. This is the context of what he's saying. He didn't throw a, a wrench into the engine and just change subjects about somebody sinning. He's talking about the sower sowing the word, hiding that word in your heart that it will manifest and it will, people will see, the nations will see. And, and, and he, he continues on that right here. If you scroll down about the seed planted, and he says in verse 32, when it's hid in your heart, when it's sown, he says it grows up, verse 32, and it becomes greater than all the herbs, and it shooteth out great branches, so that, watch this, so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. In other words, that which God produces in your life through the, the word of God being sown in your life will provide shadow even for others to rest, to bask, to be blessed, to be refreshed in. And with many such parables, he spoke these words. This is the grandfather parable, understanding the operation of the kingdom of God, how words sown will produce fruit because words are seed and you from the Garden of Eden from day one were made from soil. You're made to produce the word. That's why when speaking on the negative side or the positive side, over your children, over yourself, these have very powerful, powerful impacts, very powerful effects. And so this is what we're talking about here on the Sower Sows the Word in our, our series. Let's see, we got Mark here. Mark says, hello from Germany. Isn't it great that you have someone tuning in from Germany? Yes, it is great. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And I got a message from Pastor Paul. Uh, okay, he said uh, he's gonna uh, he's gonna uh, look into something, and then he said just uh, he can't make it today, so just finish the podcast off. Amen. Amen. Mark in Germany, blessed to you, sir. I see you're teaching English. I had some British chaps. You know, those of you who know Mark, we call him Mark from Germany. And even on his thing, he says Mark in Berlin. But those of you who don't know Mark, who's been on our show with us, uh, he was a guest on our show and he's always following the show too. Uh, Mark says he's teaching an English class on his Facebook page. And, and it's funny because when I was in... Uh, when I was in China, I had an English school and my company, we had about 30 teachers who were working for us full time at one time and we were teaching English and I really, really focused on hiring Americans and my company, my first company's name there was American English. Later on, it developed into a, a Chinese name, Beijing Zhongmei Shengliam. And then we registered that in America as uh, nations abroad. But we, we focused on teaching American English, American English, because that is what was popular 
in China is people want to have that American English. But the most common style of English spoken was really the the British style English. So it's 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 very common to meet an Indian man, an African man, or a Chinese man, a woman who speaks with the British accent. It's because um, the Brits have been doing English education around the world for a long time. But now more Americans are getting into teaching abroad. And so I was kind of right there. It, it, it really, you know, the height of Americans going abroad to teach with, you know, ESL classes and ILTS courses. And I, I was running an ILTS course for people to be to 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 become a teacher of English as a second language. And we had a British guy that was teasing me. You know, I was in the newspapers. I was I became very well known there in China for my English school. And they started a, a British guy was making fun of us. He said American English, he said, is not superior. He said, British English is, is actually much more superior. And I said, no, no, I'd argue with him. And he said, American English. And I'd like to see what Mark thinks about American English. Let me see what he says here. <laughs> uh, I'm sure your school, it was successful. We did well. But my British friend told me, he said, Joey, his name was Friedman, colon. And if you're watching, because he follows my Facebook, if you're watching Colin Freeman, good to see you, sir. Mazel tov. God bless you. He's a Jewish brother from uh, from, from, from England, from uh, London. He says, American English is the lowest common denominator. The lowest common denominator. And well, I, I, I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> because lowest common denominator. You know, the reason why people want to speak American English is because all the American music and the American movies, you know, truly through Hollywood and through the, you know, the entertainment industry, uh, NBA, all that stuff, American English has now become the lowest, I mean, the most common denominator. So he used that math term called the lowest common denominator because though American English is the most widely now uh, spoken around the world, through the power of Western media, American media, it is uh, not the best one. So he called it the lowest common denominator. So that's funny. But, you know, British English, uh, Mark, and American English is, is so different to me that for years I could not watch a British movie. For years I could not watch a British movie because I didn't understand what they were saying. Every time I put on a British movie, I would actually have to put on the subtitles to understand what they're saying. And to make matters worse, I met a, when I was preaching in London, I usually preach in London like once a year. When I was preaching in London, I had this guy, I believe it was Hockney from Hockney or he spoke Hockney or something like that. You, you could correct me on, 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 on that terminology, that area. I think it was Hockney. But uh, this, this brother sat next to me after the service and he uh, sat there for about an hour talking my head off. But, and he's a, a white British chap. And I didn't understand for about one Cockney. Yes, Cockney. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Cockney. I'm not sure if that's a region. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's a region or an accent or what. But this brother was speaking some kind of Cockney neighborhood or area of, of London English. And I did not understand. I mean, it was English. It was English. But I did not understand a word that guy said. I mean, I, literally, I understood a couple words. That's for sure. There's a few words I understood. He was talking about actually movies. And he was talking about some mob bosses in London. Uh, I could just kind of get an idea of the, what the topics were. But by and large, I didn't understand anything he was saying. And he's speaking to me my native language, English. But he's from this this area, uh, I think it's called Cockney, where they have this real thick, heavy, strong a British accent. <laughs> he said, if you're born in the south of Balbells, the church, oh, then you are a Cockney. Yeah. So he was born in yeah, he was born and raised from the from the south uh uh in, in the in the in the in the sound of Balbells or the south of. If you're born in the sound of Balbells. Is it the south of Balbells or, or the sound of Balbells? Then you're a Cockney. And then Mark says, you know, you should come on the broadcast. I'll send you a link. You should come on the broadcast and 
and speak some Cockney. <laughs> he can speak Cockney for a, really. It's quite funny, guys. You know, if you, if you meet somebody who speaks Cockney, and I tell that every you know every time I meet somebody from England, I, I tell them the story. You know, because I didn't understand a word this brother was saying. But you know what? He was so happy to be talking to me. You know, he was so excited and happy, and he was just talking, talking, talking. I didn't want to destroy his joy and keep saying it. Pardon? What? Huh? What do you mean? Can you say that again? What's that? I didn't want to destroy his joy. He was so happy, you know. Oh, bow, like a bow in your hair. Yeah. Oh, bow. Bow bell. Bow bell, not bow bell. Bow, like a bow in your hair. Yeah, I'm getting I'm getting English lessons right now here. <laughs> the sound of bow bell. Okay, the sound of bow bell at church. Amen. So, yeah. Yeah, that, that's the exciting thing that me and Apostle uh, Paul, we've enjoyed so much, uh, you know, traveling the world in ministry. It, it's not easy to travel and airports and security and flights and hotels and you know there, there's a downside to it but the beautiful side of it is meeting the people of god you know whether they're you know african or whether they're from cockney you know uh wh wh whether they're from you know north korea or wherever we you know i've been around the world it's just been a blessing to minister in in the people of god really you love the people you know uh, matter of fact i have a little video I I could share with you all. This is from my church in China yesterday, and they uh, we had some of our Mongolian friends that we've had uh, raised up and ministered to and poured into, and and we've had in China several times and done trains with them. They're now uh, I, actually I think today they're back in. Let's see. You, you might have a little glitch in the connection here. But today they're back in China and back in Mongolia, but they were for a couple of days visiting China and they got to go back to our, our church there in uh, Beijing fellowship with everybody. And I'm going to show you a little clip here, but let's see what. Okay. So Mark was born in East London. So he's not a Cockney, but I know the Rith the rhythmic slang. He knows the rhythmic slang of Cockney. Yeah, it's quite quite a quite a fun, interesting, and and, and charming a accent, but hard to understand if you're not born and raised in it. Very hard to understand. I'm I'm gonna drop this video to, and I want to mm -hmm. upload this video for you guys to see. Let's see if we can get this video up and running. We should be able to airdrop this. Let me know if if, if you guys see a little glitch in the broadcast because I'm just trying to airdrop something that I want you guys to be able to, to enjoy. I'm going to share a little clip of you guys from the underground church in China. So let me just uh, share this with you all. This is from the underground church in China. And this is a yesterday service. They're still meeting in secret. <clears throat> but it's good to see that they're doing well. Hallelujah. That they're still thriving and doing well. So I'm trying to airdrop a copy of this here. Well, we're going to be leaving for China soon. Right now, I don't see this airdrop coming through, but... We are going to be leaving for China soon, and um, I'll be leaving on the right after Thanksgiving, the Sunday after Thanksgiving. So we're going to do Thanksgiving here <clears throat> with with the, with some of the uh, some of the church members uh, here in Houston. Then we're going to leave for China and pray for me because we are going to be flying through Istanbul, Turkey. We're going to be coming through Istanbul, Turkey. And uh, I'm a bit concerned. I actually called up Expedia and asked them if there was a way to kind of reroute us a different way. But they said this ticket is not refundable. And the reason why is because after we booked our tickets, President er er Erdogan, he came on television uh, threatening to invade Israel. So I thought, oh, Lord Jesus, I don't want to be, you know, transferring you know, flights with the eight-hour layover in Turkey 
if they're going to be at war with Israel because uh, that is not, uh, <laughs> you know, we don't want to be in an airplane when they're shooting rockets around, right? So I called up Expedia and asked if they could reroute us, and they said they really can't. Uh, do that unless it escalates. So they said if it escalates, then uh, call them back. They can maybe do something. But as of now, there is no refund on the tickets. So we're going to just go fly through Istanbul, transfer, and then head to Beijing from there. Uh, but Mark is asking, do I speak Cantonese or do I speak Mandarin? Uh, Mandarin. Mandarin. They call it uh, Putonghua. Mandarin. That is the language of the people, the language of the nation, the national language. So we're going to be going through there, and then we'll be three weeks in there. And right now I'm looking at ministering in uh, three major cities in the southern part of China. And then, of course, we want to be with our, our friends and family in Beijing, who we love and miss dearly. Uh, just recently, uh, uh, some of our elders, which I talked about earlier in the show, one of them uh, from Singapore, they were just there in Beijing about a week or two ago, encouraging the body, and uh, that's a blessing. And then one of uh, the pastors from our ministry uh, that actually pioneered All Nations International Fellowship with us, uh, Pastor Robert, he, he was there a few few weeks ago. So we're excited to kind of sneak in on the back of all that, you know, towards the end of the year, right before Christmas, and see our family there in Beijing. And uh, you know, the the church in Beijing, that one is uh, really. <clears throat> and, and not a license that allowed church is really an underground church. Um, but the other churches will be going to, they are meeting within the Chinese three self churches and their international Christian fellowships that are allowed to meet as a, as a Christian fellowship of students uh, or for expats who are working in those cities that are allowed to meet in the three self churches which are the government churches, and they're allowed to have like an English gathering service because uh, Chinese government, somewhere in the 80s, <clears throat> the U.S. Embassy with the Canadian Embassy really got together and really pushed China, Chinese government to allow a place for them to gather together as they're working there and studying there and stationed there as ambassadors and diplomatic families that they have to live in China, so allow us to meet somewhere and worship. And they said, fine, as long as it's at a designated place where we can monitor what's being said, monitor what's coming in and out, submit your credentials to us, and you know we're going to vet you and vet the pastors, and and we're going to allow you know you guys have some space to to gather and to worship and and uh, and everyone knows that they're probably recording the services and recording you and. With cameras and mics around. You, you just got have to assume that, right? They're not going to let you meet and not monitor what's going on. Uh, but it, it's it's very gracious of them to to give a space to for us to worship and to pray. So we'll be with some of those uh, legal churches. Uh, Pat, uh, Brother Mark says, not only that, but he called me forward as his American friend. Amen. Amen. Brother Darren says, my eight-year-old Nathan is learning Mandarin. Wow, look at that, little Nathan, Brother Darren's eight-year-old son, Nathan, is learning Mandarin. You, really, that's a fantastic language to learn. Uh, they, a Time magazine, and this, this video is not, for some reason, it's not, not airdropping. But Time magazine said that the average human being on planet Earth is a 26-year-old Mandarin speaking Chinese men. That is the average human being on earth. That's how big the, the, the Chinese population is globally. So with all the industry being in China, the manufacturing industry and all, all the business in China and even all the, the major businesses in America that have been bought, such as AMC has been bought by China. So, uh, I think Six of the major motion picture movie groups. I'm not sure of Merrimack, but like, like Merrimack, these big names. Six of them are now majority owned by China as well. So, you know, really speaking Chinese, speaking Mandarin is really as like the Japanese of the 80s. Back in the 80s, a lot of people was everyone was trying to learn Japanese because Japan was the booming economy. It was the, the language of, of business. Well, now it's switched and now it really is Mandarin. 
uh, <laughs> some of my sons were joking about, well, should we learn Spanish? I said, hey, listen, if you want to order some tacos, learn Spanish. If you if you want to do big business and be a multimillionaire, learn Mandarin, you know. So and my little son's like, I like tacos. I want to order tacos. I want to learn Spanish, you know. <laughs> But uh, French is a good language to learn more for the arts. There, there is a lot of French-speaking people because you not you, you don't just look at France, but you got to look at Quebec. You got to look at all the French-speaking African nations: Cote d'Ivoire, the Congo, you know, Gabon, you know, Togo. All these French-speaking nations, you know, so uh, Morocco, Algeria, they all speak French. You know, so so French is 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 a very big language. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the prerequisites for a lot of the higher up positions in the United Nations is you must speak French. And I think that um, it's it's a mandatory for the uh, what what's the head of the UN called? I forgot the what the the name for the the head of the UN. It's mandatory that they speak French. The head of the UN. So so French is a very powerful language. There are a lot of people who do speak French, not as much as Spanish, but um, but Mandarin is the best language. If you can learn a second language, it is the best language to learn. And it's not a very difficult language. It's uh, more difficult to read and write Mandarin, but to speak it is not as hard as French. I, I lived in Montreal. I lived in France. I lived in Genvilliers, uh, Paris. I lived in Mont Montreal, Quebec, you know, and I, I lived in, in, in both of those places and I tried to learn French. It was uh, very difficult. However, uh, Chinese was a lot of fun and it was pretty easy to do. Mandarin was pretty easy to do. Uh, Mark says, I speak French. Co como, como, he says, como va tu? I, I thought it's como tal vu, you want to say. <laughs> como va tu. So I, 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 I speak a little French, just a few words, a few phrases uh, after intense study. It was just a difficult language. But China was easy. And I'll just give you guys a quick example. Uh, hello is, is two simple English words. Knee, you know, you have a knee. Everyone has two knees. And then how, how are you? Ni hao. So ni hao is... Hello, me, and then how? So if you could c come up with some of these kind of uh, uh, tricks to really help you remember the, the sounds and what they mean, then it could really help you with the language. So any any kind of phrase phraseology that I wanted to, to, to learn, any sentence or words I want to learn, I just think of what would be the English equivalent, and then I just have to remember the meaning of saying those things. For example, one of the first things I learned in China was um, was like why it's wei shema wei shema is why, and so when you're in the markets in China, they always try and overcharge you. It's called the foreigner tax. They try and charge you too much money. So I would always say, you know, well, why so much? Why are you raising the price? Why is it more expensive for me? So instead of saying why, I said wei so much. Why so much? Wei shuma, why so much? It sounds it sounds like why so much? Wei shuma. So that's how I that's how I learned wei shuma. So everywhere I went, I would just say wei shuma, wei shuma, wei shuma. You know why, why, why? You know, and that's kind of how I started picking up Mandarin. So it's really a fun and easy language to learn. Amen. Uh, oh, Erica has a minor in French. Now, Erica, a lot of people I met in the, in the states that has studied French in school, they've forgotten it. They can't speak it anymore. How is your French, Erica? And I and, and also uh, God's blessed uh, me with a, with a wonderful uh, relationship in some of the great churches in Paris, and um, I, I go to Paris very often to minister. And then we also do some mission work to the to the to the refugees that are there. And so we love going to Paris. I try and go every year and speak at some of the some of the great lar the larger churches in the nation and some of the great African churches too. And then we do a lot of mission work. So um and we're discussing with one of the ladies in our church to come with me on the next trip. Last time I went I took five people with me and they they just their their life were so changed and impacted. It was a, a time that they'll never, ever forget. It, it was just an incredible mission trip. And uh, we do plan to go back next year, Erica. And if you'd like to join the team, we'd love to have you on the team in Paris, France next year. We'd love to have you join the ministry team, the mission team going to Paris. 
Amen. Especially since you have a little bit of that, that French background, you can help interpret for our Uber drivers and so forth. Amen. So anyways, uh, it's been a blessing. I, I hope you got something out of this Mark chapter 4. Remember that as you hide that word in your heart, it will not remain hidden. There's nothing, there's no, there's no word, no time that you could sow in your personal time, in your personal closet that shall not be manifested, that shall not be revealed in your life, and not only manifested for you, but also so that even others could come and find shade in the, the, the fruit that is born from the soil of your life as you take the eternal word of God the promises of God, the things that God says about you, and plant them into your heart. The seed is the word of God. And the seed will produce for you, even if you don't have seed to give. You could take the poorest person in the backside of Africa with no money to give in an offering, but he could plant the word and be raised up. And prosper because the word is the seed. Now, when you you can give financially as a sacrifice and a step of faith, but you have to tie it to the word. You have to tie it to the real seed, the word of God. And you take you, you when you bring those two together, a sacrificial offering and, and standing on the word of God, miracles do happen. So anyways, we love you all. Thank you for watching us, Erica. God bless you. And uh, yeah, brush up and join our friends team. Uh, I'll, I'll be in contact with you on that. Thanks everybody for joining us for the Greater Glory podcast. We will see you tomorrow morning at 730 Central Standard Time, 830 East Coast.